I'm Stephanie Irwin, and this is the Fashion Originators Podcast, a show where I chat with fashion entrepreneurs who do things differently, all to inspire your career and personal goals. Now, this week, you're listening to an episode of Fashion OG News, which is where I, Stephanie, your host, speak all about the top news stories from last week that you need to know to keep up to date in the fashion industry. Now, before we get started on all the exciting news stories, I just want to give a quick thank you to all of you leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts. It helps the show so much with searchability, just everything. It makes me happy. It helps me improve the show when you guys say what aspects you like and what aspects I can build on. Yeah, so the more reviews I receive, the easier it is for people to find the show and all that jazz. So your words mean the world. You can also follow me on Facebook. I don't I do post on Facebook, but I haven't put too much into it, to be honest. Fashion Originators Podcast, at Fashion Originators Podcast on Instagram. So yeah, it means the world. You can also sign up to my newsletter on fashionoriginators.com. Okay. The first story I found on Fashionista, which I actually found super interesting, is that some brands are creating sex toy necklaces, like wearable sex toys. So in particular, there is a brand called Crave, which was started by an, an industrial designer named T. Chang. She created a necklace that's a vibrator that actually looks really cool. It's about, um, I'm on Instagram Live right now, so I'm showing people. It's about um, the size of a pencil split in half. So it's it's quite, it's quite small, but it, it looks like a really stylish metal pole kind of necklace. It doesn't look like it would be anything else. It's not like blatantly phallic, but T's goal with her brand is that she thinks a lot of guilt and shame, which I agree with, are associated with female pleasure. And she wants to change that through creating beautiful sex things that women can wear and men, anyone really. And she said, there's no reason why a vibrator shouldn't be as well designed as a camera or a cell phone. So Of course, all these articles that I talk about, you can, after I do this podcast, I'll make a blog post that has my little written summaries and links to them so you can read the full stories too. So the next story is about menswear at Seoul Fashion Week. And Seoul Fashion Week happened pretty recently. I think it was a couple weeks ago. Don't quote me. (laughs) Um, But in the wake of all the Korean boy band sex scandals and things going on, Um, menswear designers, according to Vogue UK, have actually been doing super well in Seoul. Not that it really has anything to do with the sex scandals, but that was just brought up in the beginning. And I do think it's an interesting context to all the, the female, the brands that are for females being very like frothy and quote unquote, like traditionally girly and the men's stuff, you know, being completely like contrary to that and being a lot more progressive. Um, there's a... So yeah, having sex scandals along that, it's kind of an interesting an interesting context to think about. But there's one designer they mentioned called Moho that I thought was super cool. They characterized him, and I do agree with this to an extent, as like a mix between Craig Green and Rick Owens style-wise, but yet somehow not like too derivative. And I definitely see what they mean. And if you click the link, you can see photos, of course. Um, if you're on Instagram... <laughs> You can go to at Dazed Korea and a lot of the stuff that he does is on Dazed and Confused Korea. They also have another designer that's really cool called The Greatest, which is the best name for a brand ever. And in their collection, they had a lot of like collage prints, airport stickers, things patched together in monochrome suits. And it was very cool. And I think it's really exciting to look to the the smaller fashion, fashionable cities and see what they're doing because London, Milan, et cetera, are so crowded that it can often get a little stale. So I love doing that personally. Next story. (laughs) UK brands are really interested in moving into China a little more, particularly Shanghai, to the point where people actually skip out on Tokyo Fashion Week for Shanghai Fashion Week, not necessarily because there's a better aesthetic, but more because there's higher spending power in the area In particular, British designers Roxanda Alinchik and Peter Pilato are leading the charge and they're backed by the British Fashion Council who are helping British designers negotiate contracts and get their designs more deeply into the Shanghai scene. Well, (laughs) a fly just came in. (laughs) Although Shanghai is not a fashion capital, it has a lot of growth potential and 
like I was saying, it's really interesting to see what's going on in smaller fashion cities because that provides a new perspective. It kind of, it's the antidote to all the staleness that you can often see at London Fashion Week and New York Fashion Week and everything just kind of feeling the same. Roxanne in particular, she talks about how people, her Chinese customers really love her strong colors and strong shapes, but I don't really understand that because that's kind of her whole ethos as a brand. But I'm happy that people are finding ways to expand their reach because it's, re it's really challenging when you have a brand in London Fashion Week, New York, Paris, because there are so many brands there. But being British already gives you a unique perspective. So coming in, you have that lens plus your own ethos. And I think it's awesome that the British Fashion Council are recognizing that you can't just promote British fashion within Britain. You need to expand and share, share all the wonderful designs. The next story I read, which I found quite funny, is about <laughs> short wedding dresses are all the rage. So according to the Evening Standard, the short wedding dress will be all the rage this summer. List.com said that it's the most popular search for wedding dresses is above the knee midi dress and kind of mini dress for weddings. I personally think that's not a look. Pinterest as well said that it's the, their top wedding trend, short midi over the knee in the UK, France, and Germany. On the spring 2019 runways as well, Molly Goddard, Givenchy, Simone Rocha, etc., have all been featuring pieces like that. But personally, I think it has nothing to do with the runways and everything to do with practicality. If you're on the beach, you don't want something dragging and like picking up all the dirt. You want something that's not going to make you sweat like crazy <laughs> and something that's not going to get completely ruined. And I think as well, young people are very practical and they want to do more <laughs> as cliche as it is to bring this up. Millennials do want to have experiences and maybe getting married is a big experience for someone and they'd rather be active, be running around than be in some confined old fashioned wedding dress that goes by old gender ideals and morality ideals and something that's more adaptable to their lifestyle. So I think that is pretty cool. Today I have two bonus stories. <laughs> I already made my, my first bonus story about the BOF China prize, but Roberto Cavalli, okay, I'll start with Roberto Cavalli because I just mentioned it. Roberto Cavalli in the U.S. has actually just shut down and has gone bankrupt in the U.S., to the point where their employees, like all the shops are empty. It's absolute madness. If you call the office, no one answers. And as sad as this is, I don't find it surprising. I feel like Roberto Cavalli has just been churning out the same old, same old time and again. Brands like Philip Pline, I guess, are kind of similar in that like excessive glamour. But Philip Pline kind of has this shameless tackiness that works in the social media age. This shameless flashiness like... Like with Gucci as well, you can take a picture of it and it's very shareable, whereas Roberto Cavalli has just been the same, same, same. So it's not really that surprising to me that they aren't doing very well. And it's a challenging time out there right now for, for fashion brands. So I'm not surprised. It's very sad though, nonetheless. And you know what? Maybe it could have a resurgence sometime a few years from now, but I think they've just expanded too much and become so mass that the brand doesn't even mean that much anymore. And I could go on for days about other brands that have kind of obtained a similar, a similar status. So last Friday night, so just a couple days ago, because I'm recording this on a Sunday, Caroline Hu won the first ever Business of Fashion China Prize. Now you ask, what exactly does that entail? You win $100,000, a slot at the London, London Fashion Week and Business of Fashion Network Mentorship, which I have no clue really... <laughs> what that exactly constitutes, but hey, that, that's pretty awesome because they do work with some incredible people. And the best way to describe her brand, if you haven't seen her pieces, which I don't think most people have, it's to me, it's like very thoughtful and feminine. It's all this like deconstructed tool. And some of the looks are all black, but like a lot of florals. It almost feels like deconstructed in the sense that it's borderline like falling apart. Like you could see um, the midriff of some of the models. It's like cut out at the side. It's really cool. It's kind of like <laughs> edgier Molly Goddard. <laughs> and I, I look forward to see what she continues to do next. And, and yeah, I, I honestly am personally a fan. But that being said, 
It's really hard to stand out in this space, but with the right support and funding and connections, you can get there. So yeah, that is all I have for you guys today. I know it's a pretty short one. I just want to thank you guys. <laughs> the, the, the small group of you who are tuning in for this Instagram live and for those of you listening to the pod right now, thank you so much for supporting the show. It honestly means so much every time you download, subscribe, etc. If you want to stay up to date with all things fashion originators, you can rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, that little purple app we all have on our phones that you're probably using right now. As well, you can follow me on Instagram at Fashion Originators Podcast. Hopefully, if you're on IG Live, you already do. And to stay up to date, you can also sign up to my newsletter, which I am currently working on some really exciting things for. <laughs> During the day, I work in email marketing, so it's hard to motivate myself to build more emails when I come home, but I know it's super important and I, I love I love writing, so I look forward to writing more. Thanks for you guys and doing like little newsletter series, so sign up for that. And you can also receive a free PDF on how to start a fashion podcast, which is kind of the little perk that I throw in there for, for signing up too. If you ever want to reach out, collaborate, come on the show, you can also email me, Stephanie Irwin at fashionoriginators.com. In particular, right now, I'm doing a little video series for Instagram all about cool young brands that I necessarily maybe wouldn't do a full podcast episode on, but people that I can just talk to you guys about in short form so you can stay as informed and up to date as possible on our crazy, crazy industry. Thank you so much for listening and see you next time. Bye.